let's uh, begin with uh, some fun facts. Um, it all started here in New York City in 1857 when the first elevator was installed, actually. Uh, uh, this is after Elisha Otis, the inventor of the elevator safety device, um, demonstrated that the elevator um, would stay safe even the, the, the rope failed. Um, and this is what allowed our cities to grow vertically. Um, and then we have roughly around 90,000 devices under our uh, department's jurisdiction, uh, making on average about, about 500 uh, daily trips. I'm sorry. Um, and each one of them makes about 45 million trips daily. So, um, I'm sorry, uh, 500 trips, average daily trips with 90K devices comes out to about 45 million daily trips citywide. Uh, about 12% of uh, elevators uh, in, you know, of total of elevators in the United States, 12% of them are in New York City. Uh, this gives us a nice visual breakdown of the devices under our jurisdiction. Uh, as you can see from this uh, pie chart that everything that moves up, down or sideways in, is under our jurisdiction. Uh, that can be seen from the long list on the right. Uh, passenger elevators in green are the highest number and also the focus of our discussion today for some of uh, the retroactive requirements uh, that we're going to talk about. Most of you uh, are probably not familiar with the, the elevator unit because you don't uh, have to deal with us. Um, so I think this will be a nice overview and introduction um, to understand the elevator unit, uh, what we do here. The elevator unit is a centralized unit, and we are responsible for all the devices um, that are under our jurisdiction. Um, and basically, we do everything from uh, plan review. Uh, once the plan review is done, acceptance tests to put those devices in service. The unit performs audits. We do complaint inspections in response to 311 calls. We do surveys, uh, periodic inspections, accident investigations, and also amusement rides which a lot of people are not familiar with. Uh, here's a long list of reference codes um, that we enforce uh, during uh, our plan examination and inspections. Uh, as you can see, this list is pretty long, but uh, it does not have the, the ASPE code, the, uh, the codes for the uh, amusement rights, which will make this list twice as long. Um, these reference standards are also listed in chapter 35 of the building code. One thing I would like to point out, because we will be talking about this later on, the, the personal hoist code, we are still on 1981 code, not the 2007 code. The 2007 code um, is only for device operator requirements. So we have, um, we are constantly updating these codes to stay current with the, the current uh, with national codes and uh, improve safety. So we have our core committee members who are constantly working, looking at these codes um, to adopt the newer codes. And the New York City Code Committee consists of very diverse group, representing of all aspects of the elevator industry, as you can see from this list. We have other city agencies, we have the, the union uh, being represented, and also Rebney, Boma, uh, the building owners, uh, this keeps our code development process very transparent and gives us a chance to address concern from all stakeholders while developing the codes. Implementation of the code becomes very easy since the stakeholders have been involved in the code development process right from the start. Uh, these codes are adopted to keep the public safe, the riding public. The elevator personnel who may be working on them um, and the authorized personnel who may be maintaining them, and also the emergency responders who have to use these devices in case of emergency. Let's get back. Okay, uh, so this is the main part of the presentation. Uh, the door lock monitoring uh, to improve safety. BC 2014 Appendix K, Chapter K3 retroactively required all passenger and freight elevators who have a system to monitor and prevent automatic operation with faulty door contact circuits. Uh, this system should not work in phase two firefighters operation. So all automatic and passenger freight elevators 
had to comply with this, and the compliance date was January 1st, 2020. And a permit is always required to do this work, even if you are doing just a software update. Uh, that's very important to understand. Uh, as you can see, the compliance date has already passed, um, while, and there are still some devices out there who are um, rushing to comply. Uh, and this is where Donald Franklin will talk about our enforcement for the devices which are not in compliance now. To facilitate this uh, process, uh, because we understood uh, the, there were a lot of devices out there that had to be upgraded for this. And after hearing the industry's concern to help expedite this process, uh, we modified our existing rules so that the applicant of record could be a licensed elevator director for all these jobs, uh, the DLM jobs. Uh, the DLM work now could be filed as a self-certifiable job in presence of a third-party witnessing agency. Um, obviously, this has helped the industry greatly because the work could be signed off without waiting for a DOB inspection and give the elevator companies flexibility of coordinating and scheduling these tests with building owners when there would be less building traffic. Um, and that sped up the process. Uh, to further help the industry, what we did was uh, in DOB now, uh, we made these jobs so that the elevator director can uh, pull the permit directly from uh, DOB now. And this bypasses the plan examination process. Uh, the elevator director would have the permit right away. Uh, you apply for a permit, you print it, and you can get on the job. Uh, all these audit, all these jobs are subject to audit. And once again, um, Donald Franklin will talk about enforcement issues, what we have. Uh, but definitely, this the, the, the idea here is to help the industry and the building owners uh, so that they can comply with these this very important safety feature. The other requirement that we have that is retroactive in K3, uh, the deadline for that is January 1st, 2027, is for the single plunger breaks. All existing traction elevators, the single plunger brakes, either have to change them uh, with dual plunger type or comply with unintended car movement um, as uh, SBA 17.1 section 2192. Uh, this date may seem a little bit far, but what we learned from the door lock monitoring jobs that unfortunately everybody decided to wait until the last minute. And at that time, uh, it was difficult to find parts and difficult to find contractors who would do the job on time. Uh, it obviously became very expensive and we had a lot of building owners uh, reaching out to us, um, asking for um, postpo postponing the, the deadline, but that wasn't done. Uh, so hopefully that sends out a message to everyone that the, the deadline is what it is and uh, we should start looking into how we can comply now. Uh, another thing that we have recently passed is the capacity and loading requirement for uh, passenger and freight elevators that carry passengers. Uh, this rule requires um, visual and audible notification if a passenger elevator exceeds its rated capacity. Also for traction elevators with counterweights, this rule adds a new requirement that the weight required for a balanced load be indicated on the data plate. If you modernize your car and the dead weight of the car changes significantly, then you may have to update the balanced load on the data plate. This also requires that you post a sign, um, and this rule is applicable to new and altered elevators. The capacity plate requirements requires you to um, put number of passengers uh, based on the capacity. Uh, and that is derived by dividing the, the capacity in pounds uh, by 160. Uh, then for this example, we can see 2,500 divided by 15 gives you 15.625. We, we round that number down or, or truncate it to the whole number, 15. And that's the that sign needs to be posted inside the car inside the car. Uh, let's get to the energy code, which was passed uh, by local law 48 of 2020. 
and the effective date of that is May 12, 2020. Uh, this local law brings the New York City Energy Con Conservation Code up to date with 2020 Energy Conservation Construction Code of New York State. And it has some impact on our elevators and escalators. Um, basically, what it's telling us that the lighting inside the cab has to meet certain uh, efficiency requirement. The brightness of the light uh, divided by the total watts has to be greater than or equal to 35. The fan ventilation power, same thing. Uh, it sh should not consume more than uh, 0.33 watts per cubic feet uh, per minute of uh, ventilation. And also, it, there is a requirement for cab lighting that it's supposed to turn off um, after no use. Also for the traction elevator uh, with uh, in buildings with a rise of uh, greater than 75 feet, greater than or equal to 75 feet, uh, the induction motors are required to be class IE2. Uh, we have four efficiency classes of uh, induction motors, standard, high, premium, and super premium, just like the gasoline, I guess. Huh? And IE2 is the high efficiency uh, motor. Uh, transmission shall not reduce the efficiency of the combined motor transmission for the class I2 motor for below uh, that rated uh, efficiency rating. That's for the geared machine, and for the gearless machines, um, it shall it shall provide uh, provide you 100% transmission efficiency. And regenerative drives are required um, so that you take advantage of when your uh, empty car or where the, the cab weight is uh, less than the, the counterweights and you're moving going up or going down in the other direction where the cab weight is heavier than the counterweight, that energy has to be put back into the building electrical system. For escalators and moving walks, um, they are required to have controls that reduce speed when they're not conveying passengers. And escalators and moving walks uh, for one way or, or going down. Um, and when they, when they are carrying combined passenger weight of 750 pounds or more, uh, they are supposed to have regen drive, which will feed back into the electrical system of the building. Um, the FSA and OE, uh, this is definitely something to talk about. Uh, these two went into effect with the 2014 code. Uh, but unfortunately, I think the industry is still having very difficult time understanding the requirements. A um, lot of times what we see on our applications is that uh, the FSA E elevator is confused with the fire service one and two uh, of the elevator. And this is not true. Uh, the FSA have very unique uh, requirements, a lot of requirements, in fact. And we are going to discuss that uh, briefly. Uh, so BC403 is for high-rise buildings and in buildings with an occupied floor of more than 120 feet above the lowest level, uh, you are required to provide uh, one, at least one fire service access elevator uh, that meets the requirements of section 3007. Um, this is definitely a requirement that any, for any building that goes um, under the 2014 code. The second one, the occupant evacuation elevator, is an option for the, um, the building owner. And I will talk about that when we, are, when we get to OEs. The FSAE, um, once again, 120 feet above, you are required to have a FSAE elevator, which serves all, every floor of the building. And the requirements come, come from 3007 that it needs to serve every floor. The building needs to have automatic sprinkler system. Um, there needs to be water protection so that the water from sprinklers or in any other way does not get into the hoist way, uh, causing the elevator to shut down. Protection of uh, wiring and cables is required. Um, they, they have to be at least two hour fire rated. 
uh, when the FSAE is uh, in operation, uh, the hostway has to provide lighting, uh, the minimum lighting requirements, 11 lux. Uh, there are certain lobby requirements, uh, signage, and the, there also has to be standby power requirements. There, there all, you also have to meet these standby power requirements. Um, and you all, the, the biggest thing here is we are getting filing sometimes uh, claiming that the elevator is FSAE, uh, but unfortunately nothing is shown on the drawings. Um, and there's no way that you can mix these up with your uh, regular filings. Uh, because as I said, most uh, elevator uh, directors are confusing this with the fire service phase one and phase two. So you clearly have to indicate on your drawings uh, that and, and show um, in, show to us that, that you are meeting all these requirements so that the elevator can be approved as FSA. Uh, and once our inspectors go out, um, they can verify that. So for the occupant evacuation elevator for buildings other than group R2 that are more than 420 feet in building height, one additional exit stairway is required. In lieu of this additional stairway, the owner has the option of providing occupant evacuation ele elevators. The elevator does have many similar similarities to the fire service access elevator. Uh, like protection of the hoistway, protection of wiring and standby power. Um, it, it requires elevator system monitoring at fire command center, just like the FSAE. Um, I think one big difference is uh, once again that this is an option, whereas the FSAE is mandatory. And also, uh, if you are going to provide the OE, all elevators in the building have to meet this requirement. Another hot topic, uh, personal hoist. What we are seeing is that uh, more and more hoists are using extensions to get a bigger platform so that they can bring up uh, things like curtain walls, et cetera. And we are getting a lot of uh, jobs like that. Uh, the NC810.4 has a table that limits the inside platform area based on the rated capacity. Uh, once again, this is the NC810.4 1981. Um, and as you can see from this table, uh, for any capacity, given capacity, uh, you cannot exceed the platform area that's on this table. Uh, when you put an extension on, um, obviously you don't meet the code requirement. So you, the only way to do that is we are filing a, a CCD1 with us um, and get an approval. So the CCD1, um, Obviously, we understand the hardship of the industry that they, the code is old, 1981. Uh, the newer code, 2016 code, has some provisions for these extensions. And to, to work with the new technology and help the industry, what we have done is um, we are approving CCD once uh, based on those provisions from the 2016 code with some additional uh, requirements. Uh, the extensions must be in accordance with the manufacturer specification. They have to be approved, uh, designed and approved by a New York State registered uh, professional engineer. Um, and what I can recommend is that because we see so many of these uh, CCD1 requests, um, that the industry follow this, uh, these two slides that I'm going to show you as a template. Um, I think this will make your job easy. And obviously, when we are approving, reviewing and approving the CCD1 request, it makes our job easy uh, because we are working with a standard template. Um, an overload detection device to prevent overloading of the cost is required by the 2016 code. Uh, rated load ratio to inside net platform, it cannot, it shall not be less than 82 pounds per square feet. Uh, the safeties have to exceed uh, the dead load of the car plus the rated capacity of the car and the margin that is or the error margin that's allowed by the overload detection device, which is usually 5% of the rated capacity. Um, no passengers except operator and handlers allowed when hoisting material. Material must be properly secured. 
and platform size has to be limited by clear visible marking sensors uh, to limit the area uh, as per the, the table that I had just shown you and proper capacity size needs to be posted. So just to show you an example um, that uh, we have a car which is uh, rated at 6,000 pounds. Uh, the, the platform size is obviously four by 11, 12 and 12 foot and six inches, which exceeds the table that we had just talked about, giving us the inside area of 61.4 square foot. Uh, according to the ANSI code, the maximum you can has, have is 57.7. Uh, uh so the net platform area what we do is uh, we divide 6000 pounds by 61.4 square foot and not 57.7 to get the next number 97.7 and we can see that that is more than 82 pounds per square foot and that te this tells you and it actually puts a limit on how much you can extend that area um a lot of uh, ccd ones we have seen um the area is uh, really big and the engineers have tried to fudge the numbers a little bit to just get them just over 82 pounds per square foot. But uh, unfortunately, that's a costly, expensive mistake. Uh, you pay $1,000 fee for your CCD1 review. It gets denied. Obviously, it adds more time to your project. Uh, job fails. I, I think I, I would recommend that you don't do that. Um, this is another issue that we keep uh, getting into. Uh, the 2008 code building code required a stretcher of 24 by 76. In the 2014 code, we have a requirement of 24 inch by 84, uh, a little bigger stretcher. Um, and uh, I, I, I guess many people uh, did not understand the requirement. So unfortunately the job does fail. Um, and that's once again, it's very expensive lesson. Building is already built. Um, and the building owner or the, the applicant uh, cannot do much at that point. Uh, but we have denied CCD1 requests uh, for the stretcher car size. So be aware, and, and this is for the designers that keep this in mind. When you're designing the shaft, it's a uh, design with the appropriate size. To help the industry, we have a building bulletin 2017-008. Uh, the code only talks about the stretcher size, but this gives you a visual of, and also puts some platform size numbers uh, based on uh, where the entrance of the elevator car is located. Um, so this is really helpful, and I would recommend that you look into this. Private residence elevators. Um, we have elevators that are going into private residences, which keep getting taller and taller. Um, the private residence uh, elevator has a travel limit of 50 feet, um, but the some of the newer residences are obviously taller than that. Uh, and what I can tell you is that the you either comply with part two or part three uh, and treat that as a commercial elevator or if you're going to file that as a private residence, you have to meet um, 5.3 fully. You cannot mix and match. And this is what we have seen from the industry that they put, put an elevator in, the, in a private residence and they start to mix and match uh, the commercial elevator code with the private resi residence uh, elevator code. Um, the construction code determinations, we are following the same process um, as the borough offices. Um, the email address where you can send your elevator determinations is listed here. And that has to be, uh, that has to come with the, the a receipt for the fees paid. And the last thing is that uh, because of COVID, uh, we have posted FAQ on our building's website uh, because we were getting a lot of questions about elevators and its uh, capacity. And as you can see, uh, that a signage is required in the elevator and hoist caps that limits the capacity to 50%. Uh, and it also must be posted within the cab 
and at each landing where you enter and exit the car. And with this, uh, I will give it to Donald Franklin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. What is this one? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Donald Franklin, elevator director. Uh, I'm showing you the older code for DLM for reasons which I'll get into later. But basically, DLM and it being used and what it was for is basically to protect the public from all kinds of things that have been happening in the course of different events and also to protect the people who work on elevators from some things that may may or have happened inadvertent, inadvertently. Okay, so you see the things there and we see basically what DLM does is stop the elevator from operating if the door circuit for any reason is compromised or contacts or different things or if some of the circuit is bypassed which the elevator will not run and that is key we don't want it to run okay and this is very very important okay and just something the number to kick around during that time period uh approximately the exact number but about 15,700 elevators were tested to meet this requirement between 2009 and 2014. This was under the 2008 building code. When the 2014 code came out, basically the same requirements were met. However, there was an added requirement for fireman service that it wouldn't permit in phase two for the DLM circuit to take over. Okay, and this was important for the fire department, for safety, for their safety. And under that requirement, we tested about 14,481 elevators under that requirement. Then the K3 came out for existing devices to come up to code by January 1, 2020. And it, this requirement came out as a five-year period given to everybody. There was a lot of planning and also the five years was given also because we knew the industry had to basically make an arrangement to a lot of buildings plan out their budgets over time, so to give them time to comply with this, you know, with this um, requirement. Okay, on December 31st, 2019, we knew that all the devices had not met the requirement, had not met this requirement at all. And this was going to be a problem because of the problem was identified long before December 31st, 2019. A lot of companies, buildings called up, we're not ready, we got contract, everything else there. And it was stated at that time that the deadline would not be moved, could not be amended by the Department of Buildings. It was the deadline that was set in stone and that you were expected to comply. Now, how we would enforce this became another issue along the way. And I'm just, like I said, I'm slowly going through the different things that's in here, but basically the fire and fire phase two was the biggest change that the previous DLM did not have. Okay, so everybody be aware of that. And like I said, so what, what it came down to now at this point, and this is a picture of basically because DLM is a standalone unit. It's not the same unit, part of the controller, standalone unit so that it can do what it does effectively without being impeded by the operation of the device, but to monitor the operation of the device. Also, devices that were 
installed prior to the 2014 code. In the vast case, the majority of cases, they required some kind of software update. Now, all these components needed to be on an application, whether it be software or actually putting in DLM. And this all, as Charity stated earlier, had to be approved. And then it went to the fact of that we couldn't handle that number of inspections. So we went to the fact that we could have the witness and get it done and get it inspected so that the compliance worked. So now we stand at a crossroad. Now this is uh, basically September of 2020 and not all devices have been done. There's a digital service notice for K3 and everyone had that time. So as it stands now, and these numbers are not in stone, but I'll give it to you. As it stands now, uh, we've got a pro about, 53,700 devices that are 2008 code compliant or compliant with K3. We have another 15,635 devices of which part are already DLM compliant for the public and then the rest of them have to have DLM period. They don't have DLM at all. So if you look at it from a safety standpoint, there's about 9,000 devices that don't have DLM at all. And this is being filed every day, new applications are coming, everything's coming in to keep us going with this. So the numbers are moving constantly. And what we're doing, we're not actively doing a sweep. What we're doing, we're going out, we're looking on inspections, we're looking on complaints. We're looking, and then we're also doing audits as we go out. And then if we determine that you don't have DLM or if your DLM is not working, then we, we are issuing violations. So that's, you know, basically where we stand on, on as, as that goes. Um, our normal enforcement, the CB violations, the PBT violations, and then we have the Ag Ones app to criminal court summons for major prison and work without permit. Okay, um, elevator maintenance re repair, maintenance control program, maintenance log and repair. And even though these are issues that come up all the time, we still run into problems for these very same things. Owners, owners uh, posting these things properly in the machinery spaces so that the inspectors find them. These things are still an issue in a lot of buildings and violations are issued. Okay, um, code of time installation is so important. This isn't even more personified by the fact that people have gotten DLM violations for not having the right code annotated on the controller. They don't have the right code there and the only way you can tell in a lot of cases is DLM without shutting down the device, look at the code, the code data tag. If it doesn't have the right information, you will not get credit for having DLM if you don't have it yet. And that should be your 3, 10, 12. If you're not 3, 10, 12, then you don't have DLM. Then you'll have to go to court, oh, I have it, then prove it. That's, and that makes our job more difficult and something that should be done at the time when either you've got been tested for DLM, whatever, you have to put the proper signage up. Okay, MCP, it seems simple. Maintenance control program should tell you all the particulars on the device and how it should be maintained and everything. Our problem, once again, all these things are supposed to be readily available. They're not. They're not readily available. And once again, violations are issued. And it's like systemic, it just goes on and on. And just follow what's there. We, it's not like we have, this is new. We've told people over and over again, and we've told the companies, and still we run into this. And the remedy is still the same. You're going to get a violation. Okay, this is more of your main control what it's supposed to do. And it's supposed to be available on site. We have some companies 
who like to have it in their office. It doesn't do an inspector any good, or for that matter, any elevator personnel any good if it's not on site. Maintenance records, same thing, description of what, what goes on, who did what, when they did it, written. These are all supposed to be available on site. If it's not on site for us, then it's not on site for the elevator personnel. Hence, once again, we will write violations for that to remind you basically that what your obligation is. Okay. Advantages of the maintenance control program, enhance safety, improve service reliability, increase lifespan of equipment, enhance efficiency of vertical transportation, avoid cost repairs, avoid my favorite violations and penalties. Elevator safety, OSHA safety regulations, fall protection, electrical safety, proper use of jumpers, uh, lockout, tagout, use of caution tape on elevators or service. New York City Building Code, you've got it right there, DC 3009. And basically it says, if you work on the elevator, you put the caution tape across the entrance of the device to block the entrance. And this is very important, okay? We don't know how many times we see it even now and we write violations and we run into it, that someone's working on the device and the car's sitting in the lobby, but there's no caution tape, there's no nothing. And people are curious, or people like to walk in the elevator and press the button and wonder why it's not moving. It is up to us to design for the safety of the public. Okay, this is just a basic scenario of where the personnel who service the devices have sustained industry, excuse me, injuries during the course of doing their maintenance or repairs. Okay, a large amount of the incidents that happen on vertical transportation happens to the people who maintain it as well as the public. Okay, this is some example of things that we find in a normal course of business in the field. We find this is, um, you know, rusty ropes, rouge, lack of maintenance because this is bad condition. The ropes deteriorate from the, the rust as they run around constantly with rust, heat, everything else, get a rope start to come apart. These are a thing where ropes either worn or purposely put in on the sides, but most likely they've stretched to a size that now it's a violation because it's undersized. The rope will not do what it's supposed to do. Okay, this is common. The under the car safeties rusted so badly that even if it goes through, it, it may, may not because it's just almost rusted solid. And we see this all the time. Okay, this is a cable. It's not rusted, but you have a broken lay. And a broken lay means wear. And depending on how many you get on that, that means that rope has to be replaced. So this is things you also to look for in maintenance. The same token, you're supposed to keep an eye on it because you're supposed to look at that rope now and we'll go through the whole thing and see if there's two breaks in the same leg, which means the cable's no good. So these are things we have to definitely look at. Voice machines, when you see the 600W or the synthetic oil where it looks at this point, then it hasn't been changed properly the normal interviews interviews that are in your maintenance control program they're not being followed oil leaks in machines this happens a lot okay and it has to be monitored but when it gets excessive then the machine needs to be taken out of service and the seals need to be replaced wherever the leak is coming from my favorite is the Permanent fuse. We decide that uh, we didn't have that fuse in our box and we decided to make a temporary fit. And we figured this, that we have a certain piece of wire or wire that will work. That's the right thing, dimension, and we'll go. So we just put this on 
and it won't hurt anybody. When we find this, it's a violation. It's a violation, it's not only that, it's a safety hazard. Fuses are made to blow for a reason, to protect the equipment. If it can't blow, you're not protecting the equipment and you're hiding a problem. Exposed wiring, unsafe for the mechanics, because we all get down there and we start working or we're running on a problem. If we don't see the exposed wiring, and if the exposed wiring is not insulated properly, someone will definitely get hurt. More exposed wiring, uh, this more or less to me is someone decided to take a shortcut to fix a problem, and that's not the way to do it. Because once again, someone who doesn't know who didn't do this will get hurt because they don't know how these are powered, where they're coming from. There's no signs on them, there's no tags, there's nothing. It shouldn't be done. And favorite is that, you know, um, you know, you, you clean under your kitchen table, clean your pit. <laughs> I mean, it sounds silly, but this kind of dirt is a fire hazard. That much there, and a severe fire hazard because of the amount of debris. And if the car's coming down, it, the wind forced in there can make it worse. Smoke and everything else there could definitely injure the public or even mechanics working on the device. Same thing with brakes. Everything on the brakes are supposed to be checked during the brake maintenance and the brake, yearly brake maintenance. And things like this here are not supposed to go around and not be fixed. Brake maintenance is extremely important. Okay. New installations. Electrical permits, that's for all work um, as for 2008, but also the 2014 code, the same thing. Um, and especially on hoist, you're supposed to have the electrical permit. And this is severely important because people take shortcuts if they don't do it by permit, or people get injured for work that's improperly performed. Okay, this is some of the things, just going back on the hoist, Cat head rise, the 90 day inspection, inspection required as per manufacturer's manual, audits performed by DOV and hoist removal. This is those, the bottom two are done by department. The removals are done exclusively, and people go out, they look, make sure the device was removed properly, and also that there are, there's no other ele the elevators in the building are not being used for construction purposes unless they were permitted. So all this is something else that we have to do. And we do that on the hoist removal and the hoist audits. Um, city of the different uh, regulations that we have to follow, that everyone has to follow. Um, safety is, well, I say culture, but safety is an attitude. You have to have an attitude that anything that's not safe won't be accepted. You have to come out there, have your safety talk, toolbox talk, all these different things to create an environment where your people will work safely, they'll work safely around our inspectors, and that you will not accept anything less than that. Because if we get complacent on safety, people get hurt. Okay, here's some. Um, established rules okay um one the first one's my favorite and i've seen it done people riding on an escalator mechanic and the helper says mechanic tells the helper oh boost me up i don't feel like walking and he's riding on the axles and the mechanic slips and his leg gets fractured as a minor part of that riding on the top of the car at normal speed um we're not cowboys we operate safely that's why inspection speed was created, okay? On any job, working above or below when people are working, that's where you have to be extra safe and you shouldn't do it. Someone drops a tool, someone gets hurt. Um, once again, same thing. Working on, on a electrical rotating equipment, uh, you shouldn't unless it's something where you're secure. Don't take the thing, I always do this, this is the worst attitude in the world. I always do this until it goes wrong. Escalators, when you when you 
when they're not in service and you're working on and you've removed a good portion of the steps, you have to secure the step chain because if not, the step will chain will move on its own, even through the brakes, based on the weight of the remaining steps. Barricades, you always barricade the upper and lower ends of an escalator when it's out of service to prevent the public, unintended public access. Okay, always follow operating procedures when you're working on it or when they're building elevators. And we've had a few of these happen recently, false cars running platforms where people don't follow the procedures and they can lead to injury. Okay. Um, hoisting and rigging equipment, you need the real thing for what the job is. We've had a lot of incidents where we've had makeshift elevators. We've had electric chain falls used to drive what, what someone thought was a good idea for material lift. Um, it doesn't make sense. Jumper procedure is you got to follow the proper procedure. You have to use one. You try not to, but um, a lot of times, if you do use them, jumpers are made where they're so obtrusive to closing the controller door or anything else there where you have to remove it. And that's key. Fall protection goes without saying. And how many times do we see this on jobs? No harnesses, no guidelines, no nothing. Things that can hurt people. Lockout, tag out. Listen, if you're going to work on something, piece of mechanical equipment, elevator, escalator, whatever, and you're not there, then you don't want anyone to be able to turn the power on and you're on, on in, around that machinery. That's the purpose for it, to protect you. Okay. Got established and maintain control of unit private. Once again, that goes with lockout, tag out. That goes with a lot of things, putting up signs. That goes with posting people. If you're working on something and you can't see line of sight, the controls, then you need something in place to protect you from others. Uh, this is just barricades, and especially on escalators. The escalators, the barricades just be fun. Barricades need to be high and sturdy because people tend to and want to get by the shortest way and they don't look. And that's men or women, they will walk that machine if there's an opening. You don't want that. So yes, you want barricade. And as you can see at the bottom pictures, all the open axles, all the open landings, and people will walk this not knowing the hazards that it involves. We do, they don't. Okay, this is on, well, part of it's on the code, but guardrails are important because, you know, once again, people get complacent. And if you're more than nine inches away from the whole hoistway, there's supposed to be a guardrail on top of that car. And it's very important. And the guardrails protect people and protect them from the south. But it also, like I said, it's a place to let you know, I'm too close to it, let me move myself back in. Fall protection, always. Always, because we get there, I'm just going to do this for a, a moment, and then we forget and lean too far, and people get injured. Okay, um, same thing with this. Use the right tool for right tool for the right job. Uh, this is a door tool We took the door open. People have used screwdrivers and other things, and they failed, and people have gotten injured because they failed. Same thing, rotating machinery, there's guards on them, make sure the guards are put back, make sure that we don't take things off and oh, we're gonna put them on later because you don't know if the person behind you has looked. So you need to make sure. Same thing as goes with escalators, that the, the guards that go in front of the steps, when you go into the machine area or the pit, put them back. Don't leave them out, I'll do it later. I'll do it later means somebody else is gonna get hurt. Uh, my favorite is uh, access to different things, you know, safe, convenient access, whatever. We have to look at these things here, rooftop seven again, make sure that they are safe for us to access and also make sure they are restricted to the public. Not just design, get it, but get restricted to the public because the public doesn't know and they will just go in blindly. 
Once again, we're back up my face. We keep mentioning jumpers because jumpers are crazy. Jumpers are bad, okay? Jumpers left on. One, that's one of the reasons why DLM was, was, became about is to prevent, in case someone did use a jumper, that jumper causing that device to operate when it shouldn't. Uh, these are the best jumper practices. The best jumper practice is don't use them. I take all that stuff there, that's great. The best jumper practice is don't use them. And questions, if anything's got, and thank you for all your time. And just remember, be safe. Um, we did have one question from the audience that I would like to answer. And the question was regarding the, the fire service access elevator uh, satisfying the requirement of uh, the stretcher card. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, the code does not uh, prevent you from doing that. The, the FSAE can be the stretcher card for the building. Hopefully that addresses your questions. Um, we, we are reading the questions now. Any, uh, anything else we can address? Do Luna need elevator need fire service? Okay. Um, so we will be answering your questions um, on the, the Q&A form. Um, other than that, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us this, uh, this morning. We have one here in the regular building. You can answer. OK, um, yeah, one question here, which I'm not sure exactly the content was meant in. It says, in a regular building, after how many violations can a building be shut down? Okay, there's no real way to answer that. I've been in a building with 50, 50 elevators. We wrote violations on 47 of them, different violations. So it would be, are we cease using them all? There's so many things that go into that. There's no real way to say, give a number of violations and we shut down the building. Okay, now, most likely what we do in a build case like that, if we're shutting down those elevators, We'll send out for the elevator company to come and they will show up while our inspectors are there and they will start putting elevators back in service to keep it going because you do need, you do, when the elevator's not running and you shut down all the elevators in the building, it's a safety hazard, so, so to speak. We will avail ourselves and leave inspectors there and the company will start restoring them back to service. And so, and answer that question that, that way, we wouldn't shut down the building because we'd always be there to make sure that the elevator company starts putting service back in so people could exit the building safely. Okay. So, right. that, that ends our presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs>